this week there was a, a Supreme Court decision that was passed that declared that it's okay for, or that it's legal now for people of the same sex to marry in all 50 states. I don't know legally whether they had the right to do that or not, but they did it, okay? And I think that we as a church need to understand, and I want you to know this, that we as a church take the stand that we always have, that we're going to live by the Word of God, that we believe that that marriage is between a man and a woman, and we believe that. We will love everyone. We will care for whoever comes in here. It does not matter what their sexual orientation or their immorality is. We don't care. That's not the point. It's okay for people to be messed up and come here. Not okay for them to stay messed up, but it's okay for them to come here messed up and having, you know, struggles. But we as a church take that stand, and we continue to take that stand, no matter what the consequences of that end up being, we take that stand, and we're living with that today. And, uh, you know, I just want you to know that. The Church of Nazarene, the general superintendents of our church have put out a, a very strong statement of love and concern for all people, but that we stand totally on the Word of God. We believe that if we dismiss the word and say well you know it's different times and different place and start dismissing the word that that where do we stand from there where do we go from there so i just want you to know that be in prayer for the church and for the days ahead there may be some things coming but you know as i was saying in our Sunday school class i really and truly believe that sometimes we get so close to the world that god stirs the pot just a little bit so the church starts looking different than everyone else so that he, we can stand out we are to be different we're not to look like the world we're to be different than the world and we need to stay there so let's let's just celebrate that this morning if, if you have your Bibles I want to take them and turn to Mark chapter <clears throat> Mark chapter 1 verse 35 uh, we're going to look at some things that uh, I think are really important in our lives we were looking here last week a little bit we talked about this uh, this very scripture and a part of it above this and we talked about the fact that it's not a it's not a church until Jesus Christ shows up when he shows up wherever you're at, whatever you are, whoever you are, if Christ is living in you, you're the church. Okay, you're the church. Well, this is a little bit different, moving a little bit different direction, but it's part of that same scripture. Mark chapter 1, verse 35 says this, said, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you father today i pray that you will speak to our hearts through your word and that you will open some minds and hearts to what you want today in jesus name i pray amen several years ago when i first began pastoral ministry i was the pastor at a church in chicago area in crystal lake illinois uh, it was a church of the nazarene and our church began to grow and uh, and many new people began to come to the church and some got saved and uh, the giving began to go up and several pastors much older than I was at the time because I was in my early uh, in my middle 20s at that time called me and wanted to know what in the world are you doing to cause that to happen it wasn't long after that that the district superintendent called me up one day and he said hey uh, we're gonna have district assembly I want you to give a 10 15 minute report on what's going on at Crystal Lake uh, because there's stuff happening there Crystal Lake had been a struggling church for many years uh, when we moved there, they were averaging about 20 people. Uh, they never paid budgets. In fact, instead of paying budgets every week, uh, we, we borrowed money to keep the church doors open. That's how they were existing. So the debt was just increasing every, every time. Uh, and now, three and a half years later, we were averaging about 90, and we had services where we would break over the 100 mark, and the debt was reduced to about a third of what it had been. And we were paying budgets, and the roof of the building had been fixed, and the grounds were mowed and trimmed, and the parking lot looked good. And it was an amazing turnaround, and people were noticing, and I'm thankful, and I was thankful for what God was doing in our midst. But I also began to feel that sense of pride. Look what I did. Anybody ever been there, have good things going on in your life? All of a sudden, you're like, look what I did. I I'm making a difference. It was real easy to get full of myself and, and to begin to think I was important. It was easy to get busy and become full of what I was doing. And it was easy to let people worship me. It was easy for me to build an organization or, and an organizational life around myself. Oswald Chambers, uh, a lot of you read uh, my, uh, my Utmost for His Highest uh, as a devotional every morning. Uh, this week in one of the devotions, he said this. He said, you cannot find yourself in success because you'll lose your head. And he said, or you will begin to think more of yourself than you should. That's really what he meant by 
what he was saying. You know, and that's true. We, we don't find ourselves in success. In success, we find, uh, you know, we find a, a lot of fun and it's, it's satisfying. But if we're not careful, we lose our direction. We lose our purpose in life. Jesus came out of the desert. He began his ministry. And right away, Jesus has asked uh, four people to come with him. He talked to Simon Peter and his brother Andrew. And they laid down their nets and they followed him. And then he found James and John. And he said to them, lay down your nets. And they laid down their nets and they they followed him and then as they begin to follow him we we follow that story it goes from there to Jesus goes to Capernaum and there's a synagogue there and a synagogue was a place of meeting place it's not a church it's a meeting place you would go in there the men would go in they would sit around in a semi-circle and someone would get up and unroll the scroll and they would read the scripture and say uh, a few words over it, maybe some discussion roll the scrolls up go out a lot of times go home go to a place sit down begin to discuss and talk about what they had just read and how that really affected their lives that's that was kind of the way it worked in those days it was every night they did these kind of things but when Jesus goes into the synagogue in Capernaum he also runs into a demonic spirit there in a man and Jesus casts out the demon he heals the man then he is the one who stands up he unrolls the scrolls he reads in the synagogue he explains it and when he explains he creates this air because he presents the scripture not as some theory now, I, I think this is so important because you know a lot of us we read the scripture and say well in theory that looks good but we just kind of gloss over it and move on and do our own life Jesus did not read the scripture to them as a theory he read it as one who is the law and who has authority it was awesome he left the synagogue with the four disciples and followers and he goes to Peter's house because uh, they went there to discuss and talk probably about the readings they just heard and when they get there they find out Peter's mother is sick and mother-in-law is sick and Jesus doesn't leave like a lot of us you know well she's sick we better not go in he goes right to her and he lays his hands on her and she's well he makes her well <laughs> immediately she's up and she's working and she's she's a part of life again he's creating an air people are noticing and, and that evening, as they're noticing, they, they spread the word, and all of a sudden, after supper, the place is full. People are coming in like crazy. They got problems. They got a, a demonic spirit. They, they got a broken leg. They got a disease, and he's touching people and healing them and casting out spirits, and, and God is moving in a powerful way in Peter's house, in that church, as you would. It's true that in a sense, Jesus has gone from this total obscurity to a place of popularity in just a flash. I mean, nobody knew him. He was just the carpenter's son. He was just a, a carpenter, a 33-year-old carpenter over there doing carpenter stuff. Now, all of a sudden, he's casting out spirits. He's healing people. He's reading the scripture with authority. Life has changed drastically. Over the years, I've watched as actors and athletes and and uh, rock and roll bands or whatever have come from obscurity and, and overnight they become these huge sensations you, you've seen it as well as me people flock to them money's thrown at them they can have whatever they want and they do take whatever they want they watch as success has made them full of uh, we watch as, the, as success has made them full of themselves they lose their heads they're unstoppable they buy what they want they take what they want and soon they quickly burn out and disappear i got to tell you something here. Jesus is a rock star. I mean, he is the rock star of the day. People are going, whoa, have you heard about Jesus? I mean, some of you aren't old enough. Most of you probably aren't old enough. But a few of us still remember when the Beatles came to America. It was this wow sensation. I remember that. I was a little kid. I wasn't very old. But I still remember that. Everybody was wearing pointed shoes all of a sudden and growing their hair out long. Weird. I don't know. It, it was just... It was an overnight sensation. Jesus was the Beatles. He was the rock star. Everybody was going, have you heard about Jesus? And, and he offers answers to us. He offers healing and hope in a truly sick and hopeless place and time. And he's right here in Capernaum. And this is awesome. We have really hit the jackpot. Something big is happening right here in our little town. So let's bring him a gift. Let's, let's make him want to stay. Let's make him so comfortable that he can't leave. Let's give him the best room at the hotel. Anything he wants, whatever he desires, because he can heal people. He can make us well. He can cast out demons. He can fix things. Who knows what it, what's going to happen? The sky's the limit. Let's make it happen. And Jesus sees what's happening. I think Jesus understands humanity like nobody else. He gets it. 
I mean, he understands our humanity. He, he knew his humanity. Jesus was human in every way that we are. He was God in every way. He was human in every way. And, and if you go, how does that happen? I don't know. But I know that he was. The Bible says he was. He was absolutely God. He was absolutely human. But he knew his weakness as a man. Jesus understood his weakness as a human. As a human. He, he realized that he would want to revel in his popularity. He knew how hard it would be to set aside all that was going on. He was a man in every way that we are. So in the morning, Jesus did what he had to do to win this battle. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. He slid out of bed. He put on his robe. He fastened his sandals. He wiped the sleep from his eyes. He was human, just like us, guys. He walked out of the comfort of Peter's home. He walked down to the beach to a quiet place he left that comfortable wonderful place where he was so famous where he was the rock star and he walked to the quiet of a beach a quiet place and in the quiet of the dark early morning I want you to hear this if you don't hear anything else I want you to hear this in the quiet of the dark early morning the Lion of Judah the King of Kings the Lamb of God the Lord of Lords the son of God Almighty knelt and he prayed and that kind of blows my mind first of all that he knelt it's the king of kings kings don't kneel but he knelt before his father and he prayed he refocused he remembered he reestablished his purpose and his place as the sacrifice for the sins of the world I thought about that a lot this week as I prepared and worked on this. Why did the Son of God, why did Jesus Christ seek solitude and prayer? He was the one in whom the Holy Spirit dwelt infinitely. I mean, he was absolutely the Son of God. Yet Jesus slips out of that place and goes to a solitary place and he prays and he seeks to refocus and remember and reestablish his purpose. And it, it, it just occurred to me that Jesus, this, this all God, all man, this perfectly God, perfectly man, Jesus knew that the success and the things of this world would and could have the effect of taking his eyes off his mission and getting them on the stuff. Taking his eyes off of what he was there to do and getting it over here. He understood that healing people, speaking truth, and casting out demons, that's heady stuff, man. Man, when you can do that right now, I can tell you right now, if for some reason all of a sudden I had the power to do that, this place would no longer be scattered. It would be packed. I promise you that right now. If, if, if all of a sudden people begin to get healed, every time my shadow fell across them, every time they touched the hem of my khaki pants, because I don't have a robe on, you noticed that, I'm sure, um, if they could touch me and be healed, this place would be packed out, guaranteed. If this, there wouldn't be anywhere to go. The parking lot wouldn't be big enough. We'd have to just open the doors and kind of do something different because it would be packed in here. And that's the way it was. He understood that healing and speaking truth, casting out demons, it's heady stuff. He knew that people would be chasing him. He knew it'd be easy to begin to believe the press clippings and to want to accept man's applause. So he went off to a quiet place and he prayed. Why? Why did he do that? Have you ever wondered what it was that Jesus prayed while he was alone? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, we have no record of it because he was in a quiet place and solitude and all that. But wouldn't you love to have been there so you could hear what he prayed and what he said those days? You know, and I can't tell you exactly what it was, but I think I can give you a pretty clear picture in a couple of other passages in Mark what Jesus was praying about when he was there. See, I think the humanity of Jesus was struggling with popularity, world acclaim, like I said. I, I know we would, and he was like us in every way. I, I believe that his humanity wanted, desired, had a need to be recognized. Anybody here ever felt that way? I just wish people would notice me. I think his humanity wanted to be popular. Anybody here was popular in high school? Nobody will ever admit that one. How many of you wanted to be popular in high school? All right, there's at least one. The rest of you, you slept through high school, I guess. I don't know. Uh, his humanity had a desire to be accepted. Anybody want to be accepted today? I mean, I, I do. I have a real desire. I love to be accepted. He was tempted as every man was. I, I think he did all the necessary things to defeat this desire. So he found a place to be alone. 
and he got as close to the Father as possible, and he prayed for his Father to give him the power, the strength to not give in to the temptation. And he prayed for the Father to give him a vision for the task ahead. Mark chapter 8, verse 31 through 88, through 38, we see something that I believe tells us what he prayed. Jesus talks to his followers about life and his death. We pick it up in verse 34. He says this, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and he said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? See, I believe Jesus is pouring out for them the things he's wrestled with in the early morning of the solitude after long days of healing and doing miracles. He's wrestling with this idea of self-denial. This is always the favorite sermon of everybody. When I preach on self-denial, it's the joy in your faces that keeps me doing it because everybody's going, oh yeah, give us more on that. See, I believe Satan is showing up and saying today what you did today you deserve moments of praise jesus and jesus is tempted to accept that he's wrestling with the idea of taking up a cross i hear people talk about the idea of self-denial and cross bearing jesus had to deal with these as humans and i believe we do also and i want you to know something really important here that is that is that jesus doesn't back down from the idea of self-denial he doesn't say you may have to deny yourself something from time to time, Jesus says, if anyone would come after me. He, he, he's not saying it's, it's, it's something that you might have to do on occasion. He, he, he's literally saying, if anyone would come after me. If you're going to be a Christ follower, there are some requirements. There's no other way around it. You can't say, well, you know, I want to be a Christ follower, but that self-denial stuff, I'm going to see if I can't find a loophole. There's no loopholes. There are no shortcuts. You can't sugarcoat it. If you're going to follow me, you need to get to a place of solitude. And you've got to wrestle with life until you're ready to deny yourself and come after me. This week, I've had to work on that. I've got to be honest with you. This week, as Darcy and I were talking about some things, there was times when I wanted to say, hey, listen to me. I'm important. I, I, I think I said something like that, maybe. I'm not sure. And, and Jesus said, but what about you? being in self-denial what about you putting yourself aside what about you not being the most important person in the room what about you not having to have your own way what about that you're supposed to be a christian you're supposed to be a leader of your family you're supposed to be the pastor of your church self-denial what are you going to do with that because there's no loopholes in that there's no getting around that you need to get to a place of solitude. You have to wrestle with life until you're ready to deny yourself and come after me. Remember the story of Elijah and Elisha? If you're not familiar with that, there were two prophets. One was Elijah, one was Elisha. There's a J and there's an S in those names, and they're a little different. I'm not sure why they would have those same names so close. It's a little difficult, but that's, what that, that's the way it is. Elijah is a great prophet. He's the one who called down fire from heaven, drank up all the water, and been living on God's grace and healing people and he did all kinds of things he was a powerful man of God he's getting older and God sends him and he finds this man Elisha plowing the Bible says with 12 yoke of oxen and he himself was driving the 12th pair and Elisha went up to him and he threw his cloak over Elisha and Elisha Elijah then left his Elisha then left his oxen and he ran after Elijah he said let me kiss my father and mother goodbye and then I'll come with you Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? And I wondered why he would say that, and it occurs to me. Because Elijah knew what self-denial looked like. He knew what it felt like to put yourself here and say, Lord, do to me, with me, anything you want to. I'm yours. He understood that's difficult. He understood that that's hard to do. And he was saying to Elijah, go back if you can. Don't do this if you can. Elijah left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen, all 12 of them it says, and he slaughtered them. And he burned the plowing equipment. And he cooked the meat and gave it to the people. And they had food and they ate then. And then he set out and followed Elijah and became his attendant. What did he do? He went back and he burned up his livelihood. He got rid of all of his wealth. He did what he had to do to say, God, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. I deny myself. I set myself aside. I just want to do your will it's an incredible story 
And I believe that's exactly what Jesus has in mind for anyone who would follow him. Self-denial means I take my life, I place it in Jesus' hands, I take my oxen, I slaughter them so that they can't come back to life because dead animals don't plow. I can't go back to farming. I got rid of all the equipment. Just like when the disciples took their nets, they cast them aside, and they followed him. They laid them down. That means they set them aside. There's nothing left. I have nothing. It's all his. I follow him. If anyone would come after me, he has to deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. I, that whole idea of cross bearing, we talk about that a lot. Something sort of difficult comes into our life, and we say, oh, it's just my cross to bear. I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about at all. Jesus is telling us that when we follow him, we have to become like him in every way. It means we have to come to the cross as he came to the cross. I want you to think about that for a minute. It means if we're going to follow Jesus, I've got to come to this cross just like he came to the cross. You remember how he came to the cross? He came to the cross as a humble lamb, as a lamb led to the slaughter. He came to the cross. The Bible says that they did not take his life from him, but he laid his life down for us willingly. That's how we come to the cross. Total surrender. Lay it down. Bonhoeffer said when Jesus calls you, he calls you to come and die. He doesn't call you to come and have a picnic. He doesn't call you to come and do some nice things. He doesn't come and call you and say, hey, let's go out and let's have some fun together. He calls you and he says, come follow me. When you follow me, that means take all your stuff, everything, cast it aside, follow me. Make me important. Make me the only important thing. Total surrender. That's counterculture. That's That's hard. Those are tough words. Not what you came to church to hear, I'm sure, but that's the way it is. It's the truth. It's the word of God, and we have to preach that. Take up my cross. I have to be empty-handed. Don't carry the cross in my bank account. Can't do it. My hands are full of my money. I don't have any place for a cross. I have to lay the money down and pick up the cross. If my wife and my children are the most important thing and I'm carrying them around, I have to lay them down. I have to have my arms empty so I can pick up the cross. My career, I got my arms wrapped around that and I'm wrestling with that thing. I have to lay it down and I have to pick up the cross because I cannot pick up the cross with my arms full. The dreams of life, ease, all those things have to be surrendered, laid down at Jesus' feet. So Jesus went out in the dark to pray in solitude, far away from the crowd and all the voices that were calling him to fortune and fame. And there in the solitude of that early morning, he began to listen to his father's voice. There in the solitude, Jesus heard the voice of God, come, son, take up the cross, lay down your life, follow me. There in the solitude, Jesus let go of everything else. Remember when there's a place in, Matthew, or in Mark where Jesus is ministering and trying to care for people, and Jesus' mother and his brothers and sisters come looking for him. They think he's nuts. They don't, they don't know what to do with him, actually. They're just like, wow. And they come to take him home, and the disciples come in and say, hey, Jesus, your mother and your, your brothers and sisters are out here. And Jesus had laid them down with it all, and he said, anybody who follows me, anybody who picks up their cross, they're my mother, my brothers, and my sisters. You've got to be sure at that point that Jesus was tempted to go and live a quiet life in the town of Nazareth as a carpenter. But the decision to be obedient to the voice of God... That was made in the moments of solitude and quiet in the early morning. So Jesus asked the question, who is my mother, my brothers, and my sisters? And he denies himself and says, anyone who comes after me is my mother and brother. All these things were what Jesus dealt with in the dark. In the dark, in that solitude, Jesus remembered what he was here for. Have you ever done that? Have you ever knelt in the dark and said, Lord, remind me why I'm here? What are you on, what, what are you on earth for? Why are you here? What's the purpose of life? In the dark he prayed and he remembered who he was. In the dark he prayed and as he prayed he defeated Satan and sickness and death. You know, Jesus could touch and heal people. We saw that in the Bible throughout and he would heal them. Why do you think that was possible? Because in the quiet moments in the dark he surrendered himself. He defeated sin and death in the dark. In those solitude moments. In the darkness he prayed and Jesus gave up his life for us. 
every, mu- every bit as much as he did on the cross. You know, we love the cross, the picture of the cross. We go, oh yeah, there's the cross. It's a great picture. And, and when, you know, Jesus went to the cross for my sin, can I tell you that in the dark by himself, in the quiet of that moment, he wrestled and died for you every time he went out there. See, the cross was that culminating moment, but the death was already done. When Jesus went to the cross, the reason he could lay down his life is because he'd already decided. He'd already made the commitment. He'd already died. He'd already died. So as Jesus prayed that morning in Capernaum, I think the thoughts of the day became to begin to roll through his mind like movies through his head. Anybody ever had those days where all of a sudden the movies of life are playing in your brain and all the stuff is going on? That's what's going on. The demons had fled. The diseases were healed. And man, that was awesome. And people like me. That really was awesome. I think I'm okay here. Their praises are ringing in his mind. They're telling me, oh, you're a wonderful guy. We love you, Jesus. We hope you'll stick around. And in the midst of all that going on in Jesus' head, the Father's voice breaks through and says, Son, remember what you're here for. That was great, but that wasn't for you. That was for me, all that applause. You've got to remember that. Son, you're, you're here to go to the cross. You have to stay on the cross. You're on the cross now. You're, you're, you're dying. You're dead. You need to stay there, son. The thoughts begin to fade and Jesus is clothed once again in his Father's righteousness and all the thoughts of self begin to flee and the sounds of the accolades, they fade into the distance and Jesus is filled again and begins to overflow with the Spirit of God. As God just pours into him and it just overflows. See, one of the problems we have, we want that for ourselves. We want to be powerful in God. We want to go out and we want to heal the sick and cast out the demons and win people to Jesus but there's nothing to do it with because we never take the time we're so full of ourselves we got our arms wrapped around all of our stuff and we're holding on to all the things and we're going oh yeah let me tell you about Jesus he died on a cross but my arms are full right now and I don't have time to take up my cross and we're never going to be powerful that way so Jesus is filled and he's overflowing with the spirit of God and in the midst of that a voice interrupts this beautiful scene as as God pours into his life and his voice interrupts and says, hey, Jesus, everyone's looking for you. <laughs> you ever done that when you're praying? Every time you pray, isn't it? The, the, the phone rings, someone interrupts, someone calls you, something happens, you know, the, the water boils over, I don't know, something always happens, you know. Whenever we're centering down on what God wants, someone will, the world will interrupt, something will interrupt, the temptations will begin again. Hey, Jesus, everyone's looking for you. Let's go back to Capernaum. You could be a king. You ever heard those voices? You could be a king. You, you're a rock star there. They, they'll give you anything you want. You can do some great things there. They love you. But see, Jesus has been alone. He's been in the solitude. He's been alone. He's, he's been listening to the voice of God. He's been filled with the Spirit. He's been given power. He's been renewed. And he said, let's move on. Let's go some other places. That's what I'm here for. And the power to resist came and the time and the recentering on the Father came. and I know that a lot of you, all of you, I know I do, and I'm talking to me today, face temptation to be selfish. Whew. I can get so selfish. It's all about me. God, why aren't you making those people at church act like they should act? I'm sick and tired of them. No, that's just me. You know, selfishness. I can be influenced by what everyone else is doing so easily. Well, God, why shouldn't I have the chance to do that? Everybody else is doing that. They can do it. Why can't I? I can be influenced by wanting to fit in so bad. I I can be influenced by wanting to be comfortable. God, I don't want to do that. It's so uncomfortable if I go over there. I mean, I don't know those people, and they smell funny. (laughs) I can be influenced by not wanting to make waves. God, You know, surely you don't want me to do that. Because if I do that, people are going to get upset. I can be influenced by wanting to be mainstream. I know these are the temptations all men face. But here's the deal. Jesus has called us to follow him. To pick up our cross. To follow him. He's offered us all the option to say no to the world and to say yes to what God's called us to. I know that the temptation is to follow the world to be like everyone else. And it's real as it was for Jesus. So how do we 
pick up the cross? How do we lay down the world and the stuff? And the answer is this. You've got to find a place alone with the Father. And you've got to allow Him to begin to fill you. And it can't be a once and done thing. We are not once and done people. We need to keep going out into the dark, into that solitude place, into that place, wiping the sleep from our eyes, putting on the sandals and walking out with determination. I'm going to meet with the Father. I've got to know what He wants me to do. I've got to be filled with His Spirit. I've got to be re-energized today because what was good for yesterday is wore out. I need it today, right now. It's not what happened 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Who cares? I'm glad for it, but that's not enough. I need it today. God, i got to meet with you now. I mean, how long has it been since you got up before dawn, wiped the sleep from your eyes, and prayed? See, the world we live in is powerful, and it daily is dragging you down. I have to be honest with you. Most of you today will see hundreds of messages telling you how important you are and how important it is for you to have everything and every need met. You'll turn on your TV and it will scream at you. This is what you have to have. You will drive down the galliard and every billboard will tell you, you have to have this or your life will be incomplete. We have to have the power to overcome Satan and the evil one in the world that we live in today. And the power is ours. But to do that, you have to take the time to shut off the world. You have to take the time maybe to get to bed early so you can get up in the morning and you can go out to that quiet place and you can sit down and you can have time to let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart about who you are and be reminded that you belong to Him and that you don't belong to yourself and that you're not here to do what you want. You're here to do what He wants. And it's time to drop the stuff on the altar that God makes for you there and to put your arms around the cross and pick it up to take it that day wherever you go become intimate with the Father. See, we need to become so close to the Father that we would rather cut off our right hand than to disappoint and let Him down. You know, most of us are going, yeah, I love God, but, you know, He says, man, you know, you should love me more than you love your right hand. I like my right hand. It scratches my back, picks my nose, you know, scratches my ears and all those important things. But it is just not as important as God is. not my will but yours lord let me ask you a question is that where you're at in your relationship with the father have you reached that place he loves you for sure there is no doubt about it but is your relationship with god maturing and growing or are you still a child who does what they want and who still lives for themselves you know what right now i can tell you something i watch parents who live for themselves and they get angry at their children and so they try to buy them off by giving them stuff you know and i watched parents who are mature, who go to their children, who self-sacrifice, who give away their lives, and they love their kids, and they, 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 they give themselves away to their kids, and you see what happens with that. There's a big difference. Are you like one of those parents who, who are still immature, walking around, it's all for me, it's all about me, and if, if you would just preach some stuff about me, if you would just tell me I'm great, that, that would make me happy, or are you somebody who has come to the place of maturity who knows? We pick up the cross, whatever that means. We lay down our stuff and we pick up the cross. It's all about him. Again, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I love that man. What a powerful man of God. Taught us so eloquently when Jesus calls you. Did anybody here hear Jesus calling you? Have you sensed his call in your life? Have you heard his voice as he reminds you you're his? When Jesus calls you, he calls you to come and to die to take up your cross, to die to yourself, to take up your cross. Have you wrestled with yourself and laid it down at Jesus' feet? Are you all in? That's the question this morning. We're going to be taking the Lord's Supper together here in just a second. But the Bible instructs us that if there's anything between us and God, anything between us and a brother, that we need to take time and pray and ask Him to forgive us. And right now, where you're at, there may be some of you who are saying, you know what, I'm not all in. I haven't given God everything. I'm still kind of just hanging on to myself. I just want to take a moment. You may want to pray at the altar. You may want to pray right there where you're at. But I want us to pray right now and just to begin to pray and ask God to help us. I'm going to lead out in prayer. But if you would like to come and pray, I would love that. If you want to pray there, let's just pray together. Father, right now, we thank you. 
thank you for your Holy Spirit who is speaking so powerfully to our souls today, who is reminding me that I have to be all in. Oh God, right now, do something in us. Break our hearts. Break our hearts for what breaks yours, Lord. Break our hearts. Lord, all in. We're letting go of everything right now. We're letting go of everything, Lord. We're laying it down. You want us to be your children. You want us to pick up the cross. You want us to follow you. It's not about me. It's about dying to me so that I can live for you, so that we can reach this world, so that the people who see me can see me love. Even in times when it's difficult, Lord, that's what you're calling me to, to love even those who, who persecute me, to love even those who make bad decisions in a Supreme Court, to love those who, who maybe don't understand and are living in, in sin. Lord, help me to love them because I've laid down myself and I've picked you up, Lord. I've picked up the cross and I'm, I'm now living for you, Lord. So if there's anyone here today, Lord, who, who's struggling with that, who's holding on tightly to something that they own, who's holding on tightly to their family and they don't have hands to pick up the cross, Lord, help them to lay it down. Lord, the, the cool thing is, what we've learned is, is what we lay down and give to you, we can trust you with. You're good. <laughs> you, you love us so much. Lord, help us right now, Lord. If there's anything in our lives, anything between us and a brother or a sister, any anger, any, any angst, any, any twisted relationship, any broken relationship, Lord, help us to lay that down too and to give it to you and accept your spirit. Lord, right now, if we don't even know you as our Lord and Savior, if we have not come to the place of knowing you as our Savior, Lord, I pray today that we would accept Jesus, that we would say yes to you and allow you to come into our lives, Lord, to forgive us of our sin. And Lord, help us not to depend on what we've done in the past. Help us to depend on what you did on the cross. Lord, you went to the cross for us. It is our hope only because of what you did on the cross that we have, Lord. That's the only hope we have. So help us to just cling to that right now and to just accept it and to confess our sin and to be faithful to, uh, uh, to, to just trust you right now, Lord. Thank you, Father, for being here. Thank you for the hope we have in Jesus.